Judges chapter 21. And Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would move, that you would, Lord, just bless. Speak into our hearts the truths of your word, Lord, so we would not just be hearers of your word, but doers. So God, give us your spirit to teach us, lead us, and guide us into all truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Judges chapter 21, and to show you how uh, this message is so applicable uh, to what we just heard, the title of this message is Sin Destroys. Sin Destroys. Now, in this chapter, we will see the nasty and ugly effects of sin. It destroys. It destroys relationships. It destroys what God originally intended for our lives. Sin is a destructive force. So when the word of God tells us not to do something, God is not trying to be a killjoy. He knows that destruction is coming our way if we go against his commands. And this is what we see in this particular chapter. Now, in chapter 20, uh, we saw the Israelites go to war against their brethren, the Benjamites, because they tried to protect their perverted brethren who raped and killed a man's wife. The Benjamites were strong at first, killing 22,000 Israelites, according to verse 21. Then they regrouped and came back. Then the Benjamites killed another 18,000, according to verse 25. Finally, the Israelites humbled themselves before the Lord and repented in verse 26 and went to war against the Benjamites. And this time they killed 25,100 of them, according to verse 35. After setting an ambush against the Benjamites, the Israelites killed another 18,000, according to verse 44. Then they killed another 5,000 in verse 45. However, 600 of them fled to the desert, according to verse 47. I, I want you to look at the effects of sin. It kills and it destroys. It devastates. It practically destroyed an entire tribe of Israel, the Benjamites. They allowed those perverted men to go unpunished. And just like 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 6 says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. The leaven or yeast of sin of these perverted men spread and contaminated the entire tribe of Benjamin. But there's something else I want you to see, and I want you to see how powerful sin is. Sin can be like the Benjamites. It will fight until the end. A certain sin can be stubborn. All of us have a tribe of Benjamin in our lives that we will battle with until the very end. However, as we can see, there can be victory if we get serious about our relationship with the Lord. And we just heard that. The Israelites in chapter 20 and verse 23 went up and wept before the Lord until evening, fasting and as counsel of the Lord. And the question I have to ask you is, have you wept over your sin before the Lord? That stronghold, that has a grip over your life? Have you wept on it? You won't get victory until you weep over your sin. Or do you try to justify it? We must weep over our sin, and don't miss this point, and not wink at it. We must weep and not wink. So what happened next? Look what it says there in verse 1. Now the men of Israel had sworn an oath at Mishpah, saying, None of us shall give his daughter to the Benjamin as a wife. Now once again, the Israelites are taking matters into their own hands without inquiring of the Lord. The Lord never told them to make a vow to not give their daughters to the Benjamites. No, oh, even though the Lord never told them to make this vow, now they have made it. God expected them to keep it. 
Why does God expect for us to keep our vows to him? You know why? Because we expect for God to keep his, his word to us. That's why. For example, God, if, if you get me out of this situation, I, I, I would do this and I would do that. God expects for you to keep your vow. God, if, if the test comes back negative, I, I promise not to do this or that. Oh, I will start getting serious about my relationship with the Lord. Well, you better keep your vow to him. Oh, God says in Ecclesiastes 5 and verses 4 through 6 that it is better not to vow at all than to vow and not keep your vow. It says, why should God, here it is, why should God be angry at your excuses? And then it goes on to say, so why should you say to the man of God, someone like me, well, see, Pastor Tony, see, I, see what had happened was, well, see, I, I didn't mean to make that vow. He said, why would God, or why should God be angry at your excuses? God doesn't take too kindly to our sorry excuses. Oh, there were some people in the Bible that made excuses. One said, oh, I can't come follow you, Lord, because I just married a wife and I can't come. And I always pause and say, why, why can't you bring her with you? <laughs> and another said, Lord, I can't come and follow you because I just, I, I just bought a land and I, I have to go and see it. Who buys a land without seeing it first? The, and then there was another one, oh, you know, I can't, you know, I can't come. Yeah. And it's excuse after excuse. The point is God can care less about our excuses. When you make a vow to him, you better keep it. God, it says, why should God be, notice, be angry at your excuses? God does it. Well, see, God understands. He understands that you just made a horrible vow and now he expects for you to keep it. That's what God understands. Oh, look at the vows you've made to God. God, you get me out of there. I promise I'll start back going to church. You came one time and stopped. No, God expects for you to keep it. Who wants God angry at them? I don't know about you. I don't. He said, why should he be angry at your excuse? <laughs> so now, after making this terrible vow, they're forced to keep a vow that was not a wise one. Look at verses 2 and 3. Then the people came to the house of God and remained there before God till evening. They lifted up their voices and wept bitterly and said, Oh, Lord God of Israel, why has this come to pass in Israel that today there should be one tribe missing in Israel? Notice how they came to God after they made their vow. So they go up to the house of God in verse 2 and weep. And they said in verse 3, O Lord God of Israel, why has this come to pass that today there is one less tribe missing in Israel? You know what it's called? It's called sin, Israelites. It's called sin. Do you see what sin will do to us? It will cause us to fight one another. Whenever there is fighting in a church, in a home, on a job, we, you know, on the job, we, we call it a, 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 a toxic work environment. It's just sin in the mist. That's all it is. Oh, look at verses 4 through 7. And so it was on the next morning that the people rose early and built an altar there and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. The children of Israel said, who is there among all the tribes of Israel who did not come up with the assembly to the Lord? For they had made a great oath concerning anyone who had, uh, who had not come up to the Lord at Mishpah, saying, He shall surely be put to death. And the children of Israel grieved for Benjamin, their brother, and said, One tribe is cut off from Israel today. What shall we do for the wives of those who remain, seeing we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them our daughters as wives? Now, in these verses, we see something very interesting. The next morning, the people rose up and built an altar there, according to verse 4. 
This is always a great practice to get up early to worship the Lord. You've heard me mention this many times. David said in Psalm 5, uh, now early in the morning, having arisen a long while before daylight. Or actually, that's uh, Mark 135. David said, oh, Lord, in the morning, do I direct my prayer unto thee? Do I look up? That's what David said. However, instead of seeking God for what to do next, they ask each other in verse five what to do. They make another crazy vow. (sighs) Whoever did not come up to fight shall be put to death. Why why, Why would they do that? They grieved for Benjamin in verse 6, and they said to each other, what shall we do for wives for those who remain, seeing that we sworn by the Lord that we will not give them our daughters as wives, verse 7 says. Now, the Israelites went to worship, got up early, had their devotions, then came up with their own schemes on how to fix the problem. We can be just like them, dear people. We can come to church, hear the word, wake up and get into the word, and then go off and do our own thing throughout the day. Or we can be just like them. Oh, look at the story. The plot thickens. Look at verses 8 through 12. And they said, what one is there from the tribes of Israel who did not come up to Mishpah to the Lord? And in fact, no one had come to the camp from Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. For when the people were uh, uh, counted, indeed, not one of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead was there. And so the congregation uh, sent out their 12,000 of their most valiant men and commanded them, saying, Go and strike the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword, including the women and children and this is the thing that you shall do you shall utterly destroy every male and every woman who has known a man intimately so they found um, among the inhabitants oh they killed everybody in the u.s (laughs) everybody in the u.s has been dead Uh, i'll come back to that (laughs) verse 12 so they found among the inhabitants of jabesh gilead 400 young virgins who had not known a man intimately, and they brought them to the camp at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. Now, in these verses, we see the Israelites trying in their own strength to try to resolve this Benjamite problem. So they ask in verse 8, who didn't come with us to fight the Benjamites? And they answered, no one came from the assembly of Jabesh Gilead. So they sent out 12,000 warriors in verse 10 to strike and kill all of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead. And so they killed all of the women who have known a man intimately, but spared 400 virgins to give to the 600 Benjamites that remained. However, they were still 200 short. So, do they finally seek the Lord? Wait on him for instructions? Call upon the Lord for guidance? No. They keep trying to fix their Benjamite problem in their own strength. Look at verses 13 through 15. It said, then the whole congregation sent word to the children of Benjamin who were at the rock of Ramon and announced peace to them. And so Benjamin came back at that time and they gave them the women whom they had saved alive of the women of Jabesh Gilead. And yet they had not found enough for them. And the people grieved for Benjamin because the Lord had made a void in the tribes of Israel. Now, in these verses, we see that the Israelites sent word in verse 13 to the Benjamites hiding near the rock of Ramon and and announced peace to them. As they came out, uh, they gave them the 400 women from Jabesh Gilead in verse 14. However, there was not enough for them. They were 200 short. They grieved for, for Benjamin in verse 15. Why? Listen to their reason. Because 
Drum roll, please. Because the Lord had made a void in the tribes of Israel. The Lord, the Lord did this. The Lord made a void in Israel. The Lord is to blame for this mess. Please don't forget the reasons why all of this was happening. Number one, that there was no king in Israel at the time. Number two, every man did what was right in his own eyes. These are the reasons why there was a void in Israel. The apostle Paul would later write in Galatians 5 and verse 15, but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. And this is exactly what happened to the Benjamites. They were consumed by the Israelites. This is nothing but the work of Satan because in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, sinking whom he may what? Devour. So if there is someone you're at odds with, just realize that Satan is behind it. He starts by having you bite each other, nip, nip, little by little, just little nitpick, little arguments, little nit, the little bite, the nit, boop, nip with your teenager, nitpick, put with your husband, with your wife, just pick, pick, nip, nip, nip. It's just little at a time, nip, nip. Little by little, until you guys create, watch this, a hunger for the destruction of that person. And you just nip and you just bite. You know how you get a taste of something, all of a sudden you're like, oh, I like that. And you just nip and nip and you get a taste for, for, for arguing and, and fighting and just like to be in the midst of just nip, pick, pick, pick. Then you start to devour each other. This is how he destroys marriages. This is how Satan destroys friendships. Oh, you just ought to hear the little catty mess I hear all the time about stuff going on around here. Look, catty, look. Just catty, catty, look, mess. I just said, oh, oh. I just, and I just say, are y'all are y'all really telling me? Are y'all ser are y'all serious? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, are y'all serious? It's too much, and I just I I, have, I I got back at midnight last night. I I, I ain't get to bed to two. I, I get up and I hear a whole. Uh, I hear about the the cat fights. The cat, the catty, the cattiness. I just asked, hey, how's, how was things while I was gone? And the, the, the claws came out. It's like, oh, I just like, are y'all kidding me? Oh, please. Oh, I just said, get a life. What are y'all doing? Get over that little catty mess. I just, but, but that's what happens. You know, cats don't back away from anybody. They just, I've seen a cat sent a dog running. Cats, are, and they get, and they hunch their back up and just folk, I've heard about hunchbacks around and just, I just said, oh. So I'm here, smooth backs out. It's okay, it's all right. I'm rubbing, so if you see me rubbing backs, I'm just, I'm, you know what's going on. They were hunt, hunt. And I'm, I'm. <sighs> this is what happened with the Israelites and the Benjamites. They were biting and devouring one another, uh, one another until they consumed the Benjamites and now in their own power and strength trying to fix the mess they made by blaming this on the Lord. Are people still doing this today? Oh, we live a sinful, perverted life. And then we say, God made me this way. That's what, we do. That's what we're doing today. I, I, God made me this way. So we blame God on the mess we're doing. 
Oh, this is amazing here. David said in Psalm 51 verse 5, he said, in sin did my mother conceive me. In Psalm 58 verse 3, it said that we come forth straight from the womb speaking lies. We're born into sin. And because we're born into sin, we have a bit towards anything sinful, which means based upon our upbringing, our parents, the, uh, something that has happened to us growing up, it will cause us to bend toward a certain sinful behavior. This is what's going on. We're born into sin, dear people. And based upon what your environment was, it's going to tell you what, where you're going to bend. What, on, uh, here's, here's, here's the wheel. And all these sinful things on it. And based upon our environment, our parents, or lack thereof, what some pervert did to us growing up or something, it's going to cause us to, when that thing is spent, we're going to land on a certain thing. And sinful. We're born into sin. We're going, and then we're going to turn around and blame it on the Lord. The Lord made me this way. The devil is a liar. Sin made you that way. It's sin. That's what it is. And this is why Jesus came to save us from our sin. This is why he came. He didn't come to leave us that way so we can blame God on our sinful behavior. Blame God on our mess that we're involved in. No. We put that on sin, but Jesus came to save us from it. He, he doesn't want to leave us. He doesn't want to leave us this way. He came to save us, to rescue us, to save. The Greek word sozo, it means to be delivered, rescued. He came to deliver us from our sin. So here it is. They do this mess, and then they want to blame the Lord. The Lord did this. I'll look at verses 16 to 22. It says, then the elders of the congregation said, what shall we do for the wise for those who remain since the women of Benjamin have been destroyed? And they said, well, there must be an inheritance for the survivors of Benjamin that a tribe may not be destroyed from Israel. However, we cannot give them wives from our daughters for the children of Israel have sworn. They remind each other this dumb, this dumb oath. They have sworn an oath saying, Cursed, now they just didn't say we're not going to give our daughters. No, cursed be the one who gives a wife to Benjamin. And then it says, then they said, in fact, there is a yearly feast of the Lord in Shiloh, which is north of, of Bethel on the east side of the highway that goes um, up from Bethel to Shechem and south of uh, Lebanon. Uh, therefore, they uh, instructed the children of Israel saying, go lie and wait in the vineyards and watch and and, and just when the daughters of Shiloh come out to perform their dances, then uh, come out from the vineyards and every man catch a wife for himself from the daughters of Shiloh, then go to the land of Benjamin. And then it shall be when their fathers or their brothers come to us to complain that we will say to them, oh, be kind to them for our sakes, because we did not take a wife or any of them in war for it is not as though uh, you have given the women to them at this time, making yourself guilty of your oath. Now, this, what, this is crazy here. <laughs> now, in verse 16, they ask, what shall we do for the 200 Benjamites that remain? Now, this was a perfect time for them to go and seek the heart of God. But they continue to come up with their own schemes. Why is it that we only go to the Lord when we're in trouble? The Israelites went to the Lord two times when they were in the heat of the battle with the Benjamites. Uh, they were getting beat by them, so they cried out to the Lord for help. But now that things were calm, they went back to trying to figure things out on their own. As if to say, Lord, we will call you for the big things. But these little things, we will take care of ourselves. Last time I checked, Proverbs 3, verse 6 says, In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. 
The Hebrew, the Hebrew word for direct means to make smooth or to make straight. In other words, when we acknowledge God in all of our ways, he will make our ways smooth. He will make them straight. I, I, I wonder how many of our ways went crooked or not smooth because we, like the Israelites here, tried to figure things out on our own and we failed to acknowledge him in all our ways. So they came up with a solution for the 200 Benjamite men who were without wives. They remembered their vow not to give their daughters to these men. They remembered that a yearly feast was given. Now, you know, it is very well possible that this yearly feast, you remember in Judges chapter 11, right around verse four, uh, 40, when another guy made a dumb vow, Jephthah. You remember he said, the first thing to come out of my house, I'm going to offer it up as a sacrifice. His daughter comes out. Ooh, daddy, you got a good old victory. He said, oh, daughter. Oh. Did he expect a lamb or a sheep to come greet him out of the house, to reach up, turn the doorknob, come on out and greet? What, what does he expect? His daughter came out. He said, oh, daughter. Oh, my goodness. You have just, oh, you brought sorrow to me. He said, what, what did you, oh, I made this vow. And then she said, okay, you keep your vow. She said, you know, but let me go and, and, and bewail my virginity. And all of a sudden, after two months, she was gone, did her, you know, bewailed her virginity, whatever that means. <laughs> bewailed my virginity. And so she came back, and, and, and we know that she didn't go out there and just fool around. We know that because the Bible said in the very next verse that um, she came back after two months and she never knew a man. You know, a woman always wanted to uh, be identified with her, her children and maybe one day birth the Messiah. And they had all these ideas about giving birth to children. It's not like today. It, they, they looked forward to that. So she bewailed her virginity. And then the very last verse of that chapter, it talks about how the women every year will go and commemorate her doing that by going to do a little jig, little dance, in, in memory of her who, who gave up her virginity to fulfill her father's vow. They were still doing it. This was the little dance. This, this was the thing that they did here. So as these women went out and did this, they were instructed, or they instructed the 200 Benjamites how to get there. They said, okay, okay. It was north of Bethel on the east side of the highway that goes to Shechem and south of Lebanon. And they, and they tell them to lie in wait or hide in the vineyard and watch. And as these ladies come out to perform their dances, you jump out, grab a wife for yourself, according to verse 21, and then go back to the land of Israel and say, you mine. I mean, this is caveman day, pull, pull by the hair. You're, you're mine. Let's go home. We're about to really bring it home right now. So, so, so this was the Israelites' plan? Go to the club? And then they gave them directions? What they told them is down in Hampton, off of Mercury, <laughs> behind the dump furniture store. It, it's called the alley. You hide in the crowd. And when the women come out on the dance floor, you grab or kidnap one and take her back to the house. Oh, this happens every weekend around the country. So the solution the Israelites came up with was the Benjamites to kidnap a wife for himself. They found a loophole out of their ungodly vow. In their minds, they could still keep their vow by having the Benjamites kidnap the women of Shiloh. And when the men of Shiloh complained about this plan, in verse 22, we would just tell them, oh, be kind to them, 
for our sakes. It's always something selfish in it. Because we didn't take a wife for any of them in the war. So we wouldn't be guilty of the oath if we do it like this. Did their plan work? Look at verses 23 to 25. And the children of Benjamin did so. They took enough wives for their number for those who danced, whom they caught. They went and returned to their inheritance, and they built the cities and dwelt in them. Uh, the children of Israel departed from there at that time, every man to his tribe and family. They went out from there, every man to his inheritance. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now, as we can see from these verses, the Benjamites followed the plan of the Israelites. They took enough wives in verse 23, and they went back to the land of Benjamin and rebuilt cities. The Israelites went back to their homes in verse 24 and back to doing things their own way. How do we know this? Verse 25 says, in those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes, which is the theme of the entire book. This is the state of our country, dear people. Everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes. Even the people of God in the church is following the pattern of the world. And we're confused, we're in a state of chaos. We're bloodied because we're biting and devouring one another and being consumed by one another. I look at the fights on social media with Christians over real dumb, dumb things, dumb little doctrinal, you know, nothing that has to do with heaven or hell. It's just stupid things to argue about and everybody can hide behind their little phones and pluck and type whatever they want, pluck, pluck, and type, type, and, and no accountability. Um, it's just doing what it's right in their own eyes. There's a guy, you know, a pastor being blasted right now. He called out a, you know, somebody cross-dressing. Came to church that way. But here's the thing. He's had many private conversations with him. Told him, quit fooling around. The guy didn't care. Kept fooling around until the pastor called him out. And he is being blasted on social media. Blasted for it. Oh, Christian Post picked it up. End Times News picked it up. Uh, every Christian outlet has picked it up. Because I'm just talking about news in the church. And then the comments, I started reading some of the comments, and I just said, you got to be kidding me. This is the church. This is ch church, church people. Notice I didn't say Christians. Church folks. Church folks. It's, it's heartbreaking. And we wonder why we're not making the impact we're supposed to make in this world. Because we can't even get it together. We're a mess. We're just like the world. We talk like the world. We use the world's terminology. We, we just, this is why I'm committed until the Lord takes me to glory to teach you the word of God from Genesis to Revelation to give you a biblical mindset so you can think biblically. But you know the unfortunate part? Let's just say you're, you're super spiritual, and you are when I'm a, what I'm about to say. You are super spiritual if you come to church Sundays and Wednesdays. I only got you for two hours a week. Two hours a week. The rest of the time, you're in the world. You're hearing the world. You're, you're, you're rubbing shoulders with the world. The very world that we're supposed to win to him, we... They, they're rubbing off on us. And so I read, I read comments when it comes to something that's gone national. I, I, I remember one, there's one time I, di I didn't read comments. And that's when, when um, I was on the, the cover of the Christian Post. And I wouldn't dare read those, those comments. I, didn't want, I just took a peek. I'm going to, you know, it wasn't nothing really that was said. It was, I spoke at 
you know, harvest um, one time, this was a few years ago, and, um, and then next thing you know, Pastor Greg Glory sent me a text and said, look, he sent me an article. I opened it up, and I was on the cover of the Christian Post. I said, good grief. That kind of stuff, it's a whole nother ball game right there. And people feel they can just give you the business with no accountability, no nothing at all. Because all you can do is just hit them back with words. You can't say, man, hey, you say that again, I'm coming over to your house. You, know, you can't, you, 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 you don't even know where they live, what state. <laughs> it's another ball game. But the, the thing is that I'm so thankful for Christianity because there's always hope. There's hope. There's hope for us as a people. There's hope for us as a church. There's, I, I have a glimmer of hope for our nation. A gl- just a, I, I got a glimmer of hope for our nation. I do. See, when we begin to make Jesus our king again, You remember it said that they had no king in Israel and every man did what was right in his own eyes. When we make Jesus our king and we realize that we cannot do what is right in our own eyes. We can't do that. What matters is what Jesus says in his word. This is what matters. This is a sad ending to this book. And it will be the same in our lives, a sad ending. If we don't repent of our sin and turn to God and stop. Well, somebody mentioned it up here. Somebody mentioned it about, oh, my boy. My boy mentioned it. He said, look, there's, I, he said, yeah, I went up there and saw folks. And it's just, he said, just like people today who would just come to church and then leave out here Monday through Saturday, go do them. That's what, that's what, that is what a lot of people who call themselves Christians today. They come here and say, yeah, 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 I heard, I heard, I worship, I lift my hands, and I go out, and I just, I'm going to do what is right in my own eyes. And then, I'm a Christian. I, you know, a friend of mine, the one who did the, the TV interview that, that I did, he said 70% of Americans say that they're Christians. Watch this. Only 20% go to church. 20%. I thought that was very interesting. You know why? Because only 20% of the church, and this is across America, supports the church. Meaning 20% of the church, every church, 20% are doing all the serving. They're doing all the giving. They're doing all of every, everything that has to do with the church. 20%. It's no wonder because the Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So if 20% are giving to the church, no wonder 20% are serving in the church. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 80% of every church, they're just alone for the ride. Hey, that's what it is. Ah, we let them do it. Yeah, ah, I let them do it. We have to wake up, people. We have to wake up. Time is running out. You remember how I told you how God judges nations? God judges nations through natural disasters. You remember I told you that? I always always told you. I've been telling you this for years, at least over a decade. I've been, well, since I was in, especially in the book of Leviticus. uh, So I've been telling you this well over a decade. If you want to know what God is doing, Watch the weather. Look at the weather. Oh, no, it was supposed to rain uh, today. No, no, I'm not talking about that little weather, that little piddly weather. Watch the weather nationwide and watch what's happening. Natural disasters. That's how God judges a nation. Oh, I remember putting that on social media. People blasted me for it. They blasted me. I didn't care because I know my Bible. And I know how God judged Israel. He used natural disasters in the book of Leviticus, watch this, to vomit them out of the land. It's it's like, it's as if creation is, is revolting against man's sin. 
And it's vomit. God said, if you disobey me, I will vomit you out of the land. And he used natural disasters to vomit them out. I look at my poor nation. I love my nation. I love my country. I don't want to live in any other country. Nope. Nope. I love my country, but we're struggling. We're hurting. We need to pray. Friday, we're going to be praying. We need to see you praying. We want to be able to move the prayer in here. And we need to cry out for our country, cry out for our families, cry out for our children, our teenagers. I see them. They up walking around, getting all in front of the camera and everything, walking around. I see y'all walking around, fooling around. I'm ready to go. I'm tired. I, you know, I'm, be, I'm ready to go eat. And they fooling around. I see them. Well, we got to pray for them. We got to pray for these kids. They struggling. They struggling. They ain't going to school tomorrow and struggling. They claim they got to go pee. They probably going to text and going <laughs> fool around. You know, they're kids. That's what they do. They just fool around. But we need to cry out for our nation and for our people. Everybody who has a problem and an issue need to be here Friday. We're going to be praying, crying out to our God. I couldn't believe last time we got together, folks were crying out for God. Oh, it was a beautiful thing to see. It was a beautiful thing to see. So... Let us look to the Lord. Let us not do what is right in our own eyes. Let's make Jesus our king, the king of our lives, the king of our souls, the king of our every thought. Let us be consumed with the presence of God. Let us practice the presence of God in prayer. And let's come Friday ready to cry out for our people, our nation, ourselves, our families, Let us cry out to our God. He's the only one who can help us. Father, we pray in the precious name of Jesus. We pray that you would move in our hearts. Give us a heart of prayer. Lord, forgive us when we do what is right in our own eyes. Forgive us when we look at filth. Forgive us when we do things that we shouldn't do. Forgive us when we allow things back in our lives that you have delivered us from. Lord, forgive us. Oh, God, for the things we have allowed in our homes, in our lives. Oh, God, have mercy upon us. May we cry out to you for forgiveness. And, Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who has never prayed to ask Jesus to come into their hearts, I pray that today will be the day of salvation for them. Lord, do a work in the hearts and minds of your people today in Jesus' name. Amen.